reefs are like the rainforest of the sea. They're the structures that provide and, and sustain the life of the reefs. So around the world, they sustain about 25% of the marine life, even though they represent only 2% of the ocean and the marine real estate. Our coral reefs have adapted over thousands of years to the environment that they're in. What's happening now is that the environmental conditions that they've adapted to are changing too quickly for them to be able to keep up. Coral reefs are a relationship, a partnership between the coral host, an animal, and the algae that lives within the coral. And when temperature increases, that partnership breaks down. And eventually, the coral gets rid of its algae. And unfortunately, without the algae, the corals can survive because the algae was providing the food source. Increase in temperature increases this phenomenon, which we call bleaching, and results quite often in very large mortality on the reef. So that's why it's important that while we also restore the reef, we restore and help the reef adapt. We restore with more resilient corals that can face off against what is coming in terms of these slow increase and compounding effects of ocean water temperature increase. We know that coral species that grow in warmer environments are naturally more tolerant of higher water temperatures than those that live in cooler areas. How do these corals resist coral bleaching? Well, we think that the answer is in their genes. There are corals out there in the world that have already been able to adapt to increased temperature, and they've been able to develop strategies to resist to this, to this change. We're collecting coral samples from across the Great Barrier Reef, from Lizard Island in the north to Heron Island in the south. The samples are immediately placed in the specially designed portable aquaria, providing a controlled environment for researchers to undertake experiments while at sea. We'll be able to identify corals more resilient to warmer environments by recording whether a coral is bleaching during the heat stress test and if so, at what temperature. At the end, we will map the distribution and abundance of naturally heat tolerant corals across the Great Barrier Reef. What we're trying to do here is to bring these corals that I've already learned, that I've already adapted, and help them reproduce in very large amounts in our dedicated facilities, what we call conservation aquaculture. And then we want to release these corals into the wild in very large numbers. And over time, what we're hoping to do is essentially accelerate adaptation that we consider natural, but here we're trying to make it keep pace with the, the climate change. Where on the reef would it be best to place those corals? In what habitat conditions would they be better served in special devices that can protect them in their first year of life? Do they need some probiotic supplements? Do they need some support in settling and, and growing in competition with algae? What we know is that it's not going to be a single scientific breakthrough that's going to improve the heat tolerance of corals. It's bringing all sorts of scientific disciplines together to collectively improve not only the heat tolerance but the fitness of these corals in general to face what we know is going to be a difficult future for them. We aren't doing this research alone. This program is supported by the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program and is also a part of the global search for heat tolerant corals. The resulting interventions from this program may play a significant role in protecting coral reefs from the escalating effects of climate change, helping them adapt, recover and survive warming ocean conditions. What's so exciting about this research is that we are bringing in the greatest minds from across the world, but also within Australia. So we have mathematicians, engineers, biologists, ecologists, geneticists, all working together to solve this really complex problem. 